note that the opinions and ideas shared on this podcast are those of the speakers, not the opinions of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society or its board. While medical topics will be discussed, it is not to be taken as strict medical advice and individual clinical judgment is warranted in applying information to patient care. It is the responsibility of the listener to judge for themselves the applicability of the information discussed with regards to their medical practice. All right, so today uh, we are meeting with Dr. Nigel Brockton. He is the Vice President of Research at the American Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, and after more than two decades as a cancer researcher, a two-time cancer survivor himself, um, and a fervent cancer research advocate, he joined AICR in 2017. He now combines all of his passions directing the AICR research program spanning the cancer continuum through cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Nigel earned his PhD in the genetic epidemiology of colorectal cancer from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Then he moved to Canada to establish his own research program, Cancer Molecular Epidemiology, focusing on the impact of lifestyle factors on cancer metastasis, particularly in breast, colorectal, and head and neck cancers. And I'm just going to put in here, Nigel is one of, I think he's actually the very most knowledgeable person about cancer I think I know. Um, and you know, coming from a pathologist, that does mean a lot. But we're going to continue here. He does also maintain an appointment as an adjunct associate professor at the University of Calgary, and he continues to conduct collaborative research using the rich data and biospecimen resources within the prospective longitudinal studies that he established in Alberta. Nigel, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, my name's Scott Moore. We know each other previously. I'm a lifestyle medicine physician, a clinical pathologist, and I teach clinical chemistry up at Weaver State, um, up here for the laboratory medicine students. I'm here with Dr. Reifelman. Kurt, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Kurt Reifelman. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to meet you, Nigel, and also an honor to the fact that you're going to do this podcast and also come to our annual meetings in May. We're very excited for what we're going to learn from you. I'm a family physician here in Ogden, Utah, and have been practicing at a FQHC for the past 20 plus years and a very proud member of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society uh, board. Uh, so. Once again, we're just very excited to have you. Thank you for having me. To kind of dive into this, what was it that, that got you into cancer research? I know all of us have our different things that got us into our specialties. What was it for you that got you into your specialty? Uh, long story short, cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, diagnosed with uh, Ewing sarcoma when I was 18. Uh, prior to that, from the age of eight, I wanted to be a marine biologist. In hindsight, what I actually, I wanted to be an underwater explorer. And uh, my mother said, you mean a marine biologist? I'm like, that sounds good. <laughs> and I followed that and was actually in my final year of high school when I was diagnosed with the Ewings. I started my degree in marine biology, uh, two years into that, had a recurrence of my Ewings. And you know, this was before the internet, the only information that you could access was in medical journals, which fortunately being at the university, I had uh, access to in the library. And as I got more and more into it, and there was a lot of overlap, you know, doing molecular biology in my degree courses. And basically by the time I f had finished my degree, I decided that I wanted to do cancer research. I thought that would be cancer research related to marine biology, but uh, there were pretty limited very limited programs in that kind of sphere and I applied for PhDs and the one that I got accepted onto was colorectal cancer and here I am 30 years later or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> very very interesting. So it sounds like your own cancer prompted a, a little bit of a career direction in your life but as we look at your research you've studied cancer but particular facets of cancer for example lifestyle and also inflammation. Are you able to tell us a little bit in a nutshell about what that means and what your studies, what your investigations have done? Yeah, so the lifestyle part was partly because it's something that I'm interested in because it's part of what you can actually control as a cancer patient. But it's also the, the PhD program that I applied for and was accepted into 
was looking at it was kind of two-sided it was folate metabolism so folate is in well, it's in it's uh it's in grain products because we fortify with it but green leafy vegetables mainly and the other side of my phd was xenobiotic metabolism so really the charred meat hypothesis that was a big thing in the um the late 90s when i started my phd nutrition was a big part of uh, my phd i've always been physically active so i've always been interested in the the role of physical activity in cancer and the inflammation part really came from the as i was writing up my phd there was a particular kind of contradiction in the literature where we expected the effect of this folate polymorphism this small genetic change to be in one direction and it was actually in the other and i i found the same thing in my data and i i spent about a week scratching my head going you know there's enough information here to come up with a a plausible reason for this basically this genetic change should only have an effect if there's low folate but the highest effect of it was shown in people with the highest folate intakes which means that somewhere in those cells they're exposed to low folate and the most likely cause of that was inflammation um so that's where i went from this sort of very sort of nutritional focus uh into uh looking at the broader um inflammatory status and then when i moved to calgary all of my previous work had been in cause of cancer and in cancer incidence and risk uh i got much more into the you know what causes cancers to progress and spread uh, and inflammation has a big role in that as well you just said a ton in just a short time that there's so many questions i would have but basically what i understood was that folate uptake into the cell is inhibited perhaps by inflammation and you know, folate is actually destroyed by well a couple of things folate is actually destroyed by inflammation it actually ex- splits the molecule and it's no longer functional um it's also that if you have a limited supply in a in a if you like a small area of a tumor the folate's used by tumor cells to create dna and if there's not enough folate um it actually you get misincorporation of other things that I mean technically you get uracil uh, instead of thiamine so that creates more mutations basically and inflammation causes cells to grow very quickly so you that quickly you, you, there's too much growth and there's not enough folate getting in there so then you have low folate you just said something that really caught my attention and i don't know if i was actually aware of this you were mentioning how inflammation can change how you place in a uracil in place of a thiamine which then could cause a mutation. I do know these connections, but I'm I'm wondering is that the genetic connection between stresses and cancer? Uh, different stressors in the body and cancer. It's potentially one, yes. Mm-hmm. I mean whenever you have you know, whenever you have DNA damage, there are um mechanisms in place to to repair that. Uh, but in a lot of cancers those those can actually be upregulated and downregulated uh, sometimes when they're upregulated you get what's called error error prone repair so you actually make the situation worse mm. and that that enables the cell to survive long enough to generate even more mutations and maybe get that selective advantage so it's complex yeah yeah definitely but fascinating sorry i i don't want to go too deep in this but it, the it, this all begs the question where is the inflammation coming from so there are many sources of inflammation probably the most common one is is obesity you know, that is a low grade inflammatory uh, state systemically uh in the colon you have all sorts of triggers for inflammation the microbiome being one that we're now learning a lot more about So really anything that causes a, a a local stress if you like um or wound and it obviously if you have systemic inflammation from something like obesity the levels of if you like the alert level is already raised so it's these are sort of self propagating and there are 
lots of mechanisms in place to resolve it. It's, it's not acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is is very well regulated and resolves once the the stimulus has been removed. But particularly with something like obesity, and you have chronic inflammation, that level of alert and the amount of damage that can occur um, is much greater. I feel like I just went back to school for the last. <laughs> 20 minutes. This is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Holy cow. You know, not to shift our conversation too far. Um, but you know, I, I'm wondering how being a cancer survivor for you has really changed and directed your work. Obviously it's the reason I got into this field. It's a big part of what has kept me at it. You know, it's not a research is a, it's a bit of a tough, tough world. You know, you've got to get that funding. You, got to, you have to be very comfortable with rejection, you know, whether that's grants or papers or... So having that fundamental drive because of my own experience, and really I got into it out of pure personal and selfish curiosity. Um, but as I've kind of gone through my career, and one of the reasons why I transitioned to the position that I have now is... I do have a pretty unique perspective. You know, I've seen it from the other side of, of the desk, if you like. I, I understand a lot of the processes behind it. I've done a lot of, uh, a, a lot of the sort of touch points that I've had with people have been through uh, cycling and skiing, things that I've done a, a lot of. And because of those connections, people trust me, for want of a better word. <laughs> You know, they, they know I understand from the patient's point of view. They know I have at least access. I'm always very careful to say, you know, I'm not a clinician. I'm not giving you clinical advice or information, but I'm just trying to give you, I can access that information and try and translate it. That, you know, so having that survivorship context is huge. But it's also, I, I gave a webinar to a, a group of advanced prostate cancer patients, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And you know, in my role at AICR, I spend a lot of time being you know, very disciplined about the research that's been done and what claims we can make and how 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 rigorous that evidence is, how and, and that bar is very high. You know, and, and we are reluctant to, to make any claims or give any advice unless it's pretty cast iron. But you realize you're in a, a, a landscape or an ecosystem where people are getting information, not always true information. And we have to, you know, for this group of prostate cancer patients, their attitude was very much, well, that's great, but we need answers today. You know, we can't wait for the, the evidence to be perfect. So every now and again, I, I have these context it's good to be reminded from people that are facing this. My, you know, my, it'll be 30 years next month since I finished treatment. Mm. Um, I still remember it. It's still a driver for me every day. But you also, it's good to have those reminders that people are facing the daily consequences of this every day. Nigel, you mentioned the a AICR, American Institute of Cancer Research. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Would you talk about your career path and how you ended up at the uh, AICR and and what you're doing there? Yeah, so uh, the American Institute for Cancer Research, I first became aware of them in 1997 when I started my PhD and they published the first expert report, which was really the first attempt to synthesize all of the global evidence on diet, nutrition, physical activity uh, and cancer. And at that point, there was there's a lot of evidence that needed to be uh, summarized, if you like, but it was still fairly limited. A lot of case control studies, a lot of ecological studies, uh, very few cohorts and pretty much no randomized control trials. But it was still like, the, the main reference document uh, for my PhD. Then in 2007, AICR, WCRF, World Cancer Research Fund, 
published the second expert report. In that 10 years, the evidence and the, the volume of research has it, had exploded. I mean, AICR were founded in uh, 1982, specifically to try and address the the need for to highlight the role of diet and nutrition in, in cancer risk. A lot of people didn't believe it at all. And we were seen as snake oil salesmen making claims about things that there was no possibility that they could have a role in, in cancer risk and outcomes. Obviously, spool forward 40 years, and that is all, all of the things that we were championing are mainstream public health messages. But that happened very kind of incrementally. In 2007, I was starting my faculty position in Calgary. The second expert report came out. A whole process had been put in place to much more rigorously assess the evidence. So we didn't actually include case control studies anymore. Rather than it just being a narrative synthesis, so just like a systematic review where you narrate, if you like, the outcomes, it was all meta-analyses, so actually giving quantitative estimates of, of risk and a, a very formalized way of grading the evidence. So strong evidence was convincing and probable, and there are sort of criteria for what reaches that bar. And then limited evidence was either suggestive or no conclusion. And there's also one that is, uh, is a strong evidence conclusion, but saying that um, it's unlikely to do any harm. Uh, which for things like beta carotene was show that there were trials done uh, in the 90s. My mother was duly giving me beta carotene tablets when I was going through treatment, but when they did trials of it, they actually showed that it increased the risk of, of lung cancer in smokers. So then it was like, oh, you know, what's the effect of this in other cancer? And certainly in things like prostate, there's no, no risk, n not necessarily any benefit, but you know, we're just trying to really, it's. The whole reason AICR exists is to d distinguish evidence from opinion. You know, we've all seen those media reports that say something's good for you this week and then next week they're like, oh no, that's bad for you. And the consumer just gets fatigued and, and gives up and just eats what they like. Or... Even physicians like us, we all get confused because we hear so many different voices. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's why our, you know, our role is just trying to distinguish the evidence from opinion so that we can give some people some clarity about how strong the evidence is and how strong the effect is. Sure. Nigel, so uh, where is the bridge or what is the bridge that the AICR has between you and a family doctor in Ogden trying to take care of a population? So we create a lot of uh, materials, uh, brochures, we do webinars. So, I mean, our website is a trove of information. So if, and, and we don't tend, we give, we give lifestyle advice. We don't give cancer treatment advice. So right. a lot of what we are, a lot of what we're aiming at are the people before they get cancer to try and reduce their risk of cancer. But we do have a lot of materials for, for cancer patients in terms of what they should be doing with their lifestyle. But it's very much complementary to their treatment. Not, we're not trying to suggest that these are things you do instead of uh, conventional therapy. Wonderful. Nigel, one of the cool things that, that we have so many things in common. We got the haircut in common, we got the interest in science in common, we got skiing in common, and, and I'll be honest, I actually didn't know that there was any skiing in Scotland. Yeah, I, I was brought up in a tiny little village in the middle of Scotland, next to the mountains, and we had skiing as, as part of our elementary school curriculum on a Friday morning. That's, that's awesome. I grew up in the tundra of Colorado, and I was 10 minutes away from a ski resort, but I had to wait till the weekend to go. Now, as a former, you know, you are a champion speed skier, and now you're an avid cyclist, so you're, you're very um, physically fit. Are there other ways that you currently live and that promote the cancer prevention method? I, I think it's always a package. The whole sort of approach to our recommendations is that you know, there's not one thing that you should do. The more, you know, the evidence that we now have, which is really only over the last 10 years, you know, all of these recommendations are based on strong evidence. So you would expect them, you know, adhering to them would reduce your cancer risk. But it's only about the last 10 years that we've had the evidence showing that if you, 
look at the level of adherence that people show, it actually does have an impact both on cancer risk, uh, reducing cancer risk and uh, improving outcomes after diagnosis. I, I follow all of them, basically. There's a great tool called the Cancer Health Check. If you go to cancerhealthcheck.org, it's a very quick two or three minute questionnaire, which gives you very instant feedback on how well you're doing meeting each of the recommendations. I'm a, you know, within the normal BMI range. I'm way above the physical activity uh, recommendations. I eat a pretty good diet. One where I do score poorly on is processed food. Not because I, you know, I cook all my meals from scratch, but I do love cookies. So, <laughs> so that counts against me. I do drink, not uh, heavily, certainly well within the, the national guidelines. Don't tend to eat processed meat. I eat a bit of red meat, but try to mix it up. I, I don't drink uh, sodas. I, I mean, in terms of, I think, the decisions that people can make that are the easy wins. Controlling weight for a lot of people is difficult. Embarking on physical activity if you're new to it can be can be hard. But I think you know, not drinking sodas and limiting alcohol consumption are probably two of the easiest ones that people could do right now. You know, there are so many good alternatives. We try to make our recommendations accessible. If we said, you know, absolutely no red meat, absolutely no processed food, absolutely no alcohol, absolutely no so people would just say, well, I'm, I'm not going to do that, and they would just give up. So I think you know, limiting is uh, not making these everyday items that you consume. Is a, is a good strategy and just replacing them with things that you know, are still palatable. You know, what I, kind of what I, what I tell people when they, you know, when they ask me, they're like, oh, it's like, are you vegan? Like, you know, like well, I, I, I'm not exclusively, but I do, my, my plate is mostly fruits and vegetables and nuts and whole grains and legumes and stuff. But the nice thing is, is that it doesn't have to be 100%. Your body has, has the ability to handle occasional insults to it. But let's just make those occasional and not every day, every meal occurrences. Absolutely. It's, it's your habits that define your health, not the, the exceptions. You know, I'm just thrilled to hear that both of you guys are realistic humans. It makes me, <laughs> makes me comfortable to be with you in this interview. Uh, um, uh, speaking of cancer risk, I've heard a little bit about an analogy that you use, Nigel, called the bathtub analogy. Do you have time to talk about that? Yeah. So I used to use the cancer lottery analogy, which is, you know, but it's kind of, that's a kind of reverse analogy in that um, the, it, it's the lottery that you don't want to win. And the more unhealthy behaviors that you adopt or take part in, you're basically buying more tickets, which doesn't mean you'll win the cancer lottery and, and get cancer, uh, which is a weird concept but it increases your chance. So I was trying to, th I was actually thinking about a completely different aspect of cancer research, but I started thinking about how during our lives, we all accumulate cellular damage that increases the chances of developing cancer. And I thought of it like a, a bathtub that's filling up. And as we accumulate this damage, the it's like a leaky faucet that's feeding into this bathtub that's filling up. And you know, at some point that water overflows and that kind of represents cancer's ability to break out of its local environment and metastasize and cause all its havoc. And then I thought, well, that doesn't account for the fact that actually anyone can get cancer at any time. So then I thought, well, this is an old fashioned claw foot bathtub with one wobbly leg. The more water there is in our bath bathtubs and the more damage we've accumulated, the more chance there is for it to kind of slosh out uh, if, if there's some sort of insult. But actually we're all born with some water in our bath. So, you know, there's childhood cancer. You know, my, my cancer was technically a childhood cancer because I was 18. That is just random bad luck and you know some sort of insult that's tipped the bath and then i thought well how do we control the rate this accumulation of water and that is really through our lifestyle so the poorer 
um, decisions we make, the faster our bathtub is filling up. And but we can slow that down and make sure that we know from screening studies that our bathtubs are getting pretty full by the time we're in our fifties. So the earlier we start to adopt healthy lifestyle factors, the lower we can keep our cancer bathtub water. But it's never too late. If things are precarious in those upper sort of ages, the lower you are, the safer you are. You hear these stories of, well, my grandmother smoked and you know, two packs a day until she was a hundred. And like, yes, every now and again, someone, if you like, gets away with that lifestyle. But most people don't. But there is that. There's always going to be that random element to to cancer. Um, yeah, not quite such a wobbly leg. I appreciate that analogy. It, it, it's a wonderful analogy. I think it's something I can use when I talk to patients. So I appreciate you putting the thought into that and making it where the rubber meets the road. I'll use that. Kurt brought up a good point. Like he wants to use stuff. And, and if we're as physicians trying to use things to demonstrate these, these cancer risks to our patients, what are some common um, you know, myths or misperceptions that our patients might have that we might not think they have. So I think the big one is genetics, that people really think that cancer is a genetic disease, which to, you know, to, to some extent it is. But even when we published the third expert report in 2018, we, we were talking about how we were going to message this report. And there was a suggestion that we say, these factors are even more important to, to people with genetic predispositions, so family history or BRCA1 or 2 or Lynch syndrome and colorectal cancer. And I was like, we don't actually have that evidence yet. So in 2018, we didn't know that. We do now. And so even in that short period, the last five years, the evidence is really showing us that the, the impact of lifestyle is even greater in people that are at a higher genetic risk. But it could have gone either way. You know, genetics could have overwhelmed lifestyle, or you could say, well, it's obvious that uh, lifestyle is more important. We needed the research to be done to show that. And now we know if you're at a higher genetic risk, it's even more important that you adopt these healthy lifestyles to, to minimize your risk. So I think that's probably the, the biggest myth out there, but there are, there are many. We could do a whole podcast just on <laughs> covering the myths, especially in this age of misinformation. Well, uh, I'm going to ask a question again, trying to help me in my medical practice and maybe in my own life also <laughs> on a personal level. But is there one message or one lifestyle intervention that would be most beneficial? I think you've touched on a few and you've almost hinted at one of them. But if, if there was one that you would recommend for me or that I would recommend to my patients, where would you put your money? I think physical activity is enormously important. And, and that doesn't have to be exercise. It can be just moving your body. That can be household chores. It can be taking the stairs rather than the elevator. Incorporating activity into daily life. And I would never have expected my stepmother to be an example. And this isn't a cancer story, but it, it proves a point. Uh, she had smoked all her life in her early 70s, was basically incapacitated by COPD. And she started going to the gym, which was literally just walking on a treadmill. But that basically got her 10 years of massively elevated quality of life, where she could go for a walk and go shopping and do just normal everyday things. So I think if you are sedentary, I, you know, very low activity. That is one of the things. It's often said, if exercise was a pill, we would give it to everyone. So I think that's really a foundational behavior that you'd want to build into your life. Back in the day of the paper prescription, before we went to electronic medical records, I think a lot of us wrote out exercise on a paper prescription, almost like a pill, right? But it's hard to do on the electronic medical record anymore. I'm curious, was it your mother-in-law you mentioned with the COPD? Uh, my stepmother. Your yeah. stepmother, yes. Yeah. So what motivated her at that age to exercise? I'm curious because I'd like motivating my patients. I think it was just the fact they came to visit me in, uh, in Scotland and it took her about 20 minutes to go up four flights of stairs to the, the apartment that I was living in. And that literally would do these two short flights and then have to take a break. And I think it was just a bit of a wake up call. How do you turn that around? Uh, and I think she, she may have given up smoking shortly before that. But I think the combination of having given up the smoking, which 
maybe stopped the, the progression of the disease, but then needed something to try and adjust for the damage that had been done. But you know, she got to the stage where they could go on a one or two mile walk down the seaside, uh, which would have been inconceivable before she started going to the gym. Excellent. That's just great. It shows the raw power of something so simple. Yeah, and at that age, and with that yeah. degree of incapacitation, just showing it's never too late to make good decisions. Nigel, as we're kind of closing up on this, I wanted to know if, if there was one thing that you'd like to share with us. If there's anything that um, you feel we miss, uh, we didn't represent enough today. Just start is the first thing. You know, it's always too easy to, you know, wait until the next year of uh, New Year's resolutions or everyone that I know who's you know, decided to, to make lifestyle changes says, I wish I'd done it earlier. So do it now. Don't even put it off to tomorrow. Just do it now. Go and do the cancer health check. Identify the areas that you think you can succeed in because when you succeed in those, it makes you more willing to push on to the next ones. I mean, the other thing is, I often hear we haven't made enough progress in, in cancer research. And while I totally understand that perspective, I think it's very wrong. We have made massive progress in, not just in the treatment, but in the societal acknowledgement of cancer. So when I was being treated in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, people wouldn't even use the word. And now, so people that I knew fairly well, that I had no idea had been through cancer treatment. I, I was always very open about mine, but I think the fact that people can, can share their cancer experience is you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. I think it, it makes a massive difference. And part of that is because cancer is no longer a death sentence. You know, we all know someone who has had it, survived it, thrived beyond it. And we all know someone who has, has unfortunately lost their, their battle with cancer. The odds are certainly in our favor now that there's a better chance it will beat it than not. And a good way to approach that is through lifestyle. When you hear political leaders talk about cancer, for example, discuss a moonshot and eliminating cancer, what's your gut reaction when you hear that? It's mixed, because on one hand, I'm delighted that there's being resources and intent put into this. When President Biden relaunched the moonshot last year, I was frustrated because he said, we know cancer is a disease that there are a few ways to prevent. <laughs> we know how to prevent 40% of it at least with the information that we have now. And if we could implement policies, it would make it easier for people to live healthier lives. And so, but there are many, many good things from the, the cancer moonshot. So it's, it's a mixed reaction. Thank you, I was wondering about that. Well, let's just say that in the ways that current Americans live, we don't know how to prevent a lot. Well, there's, there's a big dichotomy because we every few years we do a cancer risk factor awareness survey and pretty consistently there's about half of the population that don't, that were unaware that, for instance, red meat, processed meat causes cancer, alcohol, low physical activity, all of these sort of exposures that are the, the core of our message still only about half of the population are aware of them. But then the other half of the population say, oh man, we've heard all this before. So <laughs> we have to keep going to try and get that message through to the people that haven't received it without switching off the people who have heard it. And you know, some of them are living it and some of them are like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Do you have any hobbies outside of uh, research? I, I still love skiing. Don't get to do it half enough as I, as much as I'd like to. I ride my bike every day. So I, I commute to and from work by bike. And then I go riding in the weekends. I have a two-year-old boxer border collie cross dog who keeps me entertained. I actually quite like cooking because I like eating. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty fully occupied. Well, Nigel, thank you so much. And I'll, I'll give you an offer. You, you come visit me, we'll go skiing in the winter. You come visit me in the winter, we'll go skiing up at Nordic Valley. Gonna happen. Gonna happen. <laughs> well, I'll come out in, I'm coming out in May for the meeting. 
and I hope to ride my bike at some point there, but uh, definitely to come when the snow is still there. Yes, <laughs> lots of good trails up here. Well, Nigel, thank you so, so much. This has been such a wonderful podcast episode today. Um, we, I feel like, I mean, I've even learned, stuff, especially in, like, I know Kurt has learned stuff, and I feel we all have learned stuff about cancer and how to treat patients better, uh, how to prevent and how to stop the progression of cancer. So you had a question about uh, the biggest advance. Yeah. What do you so, feel? Um, what do you feel is the biggest advance in cancer recently that we may or may not know about as physicians? As far as uh, advancements in prevention or advancements in treatment, I guess we're pri- primarily Nigel. Any major advancements in uh, prevention of cancer? I think I, I can definitely talk about the, the treatment part. Are there any major advancements in the in the recent past as far as treatment of cancer for those that are suffering? Absolutely. The the biggest change has been the focus on the immune system. You know, we went through the era of targeted therapies, which have uh, shown some benefits in some in some cancers, but they the targeted therapies where you look for a mutation and then find a you know, a drug that targets that or an antibody that targets it have some benefits, but since 2011-12, the immunotherapies have just absolutely exploded. One of the tricks that cancer plays is to basically hide from the immune system. And it has this way of putting the brakes on the immune system around the cancer. Uh, and these drugs take those brakes off and allow the, the immune system to get in there. Um, there, there are all, that's one, those are called checkpoint inhibitors. There are also cell based where you basically take patients T cells, re-engineer them, put them back in so that they, they're targeted directly to the cancers. But the people that it works in, it, it's, it's amazing. Cancers that were uniformly fatal, there are a lot of people being cured. But then there are people that it doesn't work for. And one of the big questions is how do we work, make it work better? And I believe that you know, all of these immune therapies still require you to have a functioning immune system. And so many of the lifestyle factors benefit the immune system. So I think we're gonna see a lot of uh, intersection between uh, lifestyle. We know for instance, that higher fiber diets have a big impact on the microbiome and your microbiome has a big impact on the efficacy of immunotherapies, the checkpoint inhibitors. So, and I think where we're going next with all of this is with mRNA vaccines that would, the technology was finally fully developed for COVID, but we can make potentially individually targeted vaccines to so that you basically flag the tumor with the the vaccine and then the immune system comes in and takes care of the tumor so i think this this convergence between lifestyle and oncology uh, and immunotherapy is going to be huge and, and it already is i mean the stage four melanoma now is actually a curable disease through immunotherapies for for a subset of the patients but it was you know there was no subset before so you mentioned a uh, a tool check cancer risk or what, what was the name cancerhealthcheck.org Okay. Are you uh, anyhow involved with that, or is that just a tool you? Yeah, re- it, it was developed from. So after we after we published a third expert report, and we came out with our recommendations, we worked with the NCI to come up with a standardised scoring system. Because when the two thousand and seven report was done, and we had ten recommendations, the research field all kind of used those recommendations to score lifestyle, but they all did it differently. So it's really difficult to to compare across studies. So we worked with the NCI to come up with a standardized scoring mechanism uh, so that the, any subsequent studies would be easier to compare. Research is being researched, they, they still tweak it a little bit, but fundamentally it's fairly similar. And then we thought, well, we could use that scoring system to create a tool for people to score their own lifestyle. And it's literally, you know, it gives you a smiley face if you're meeting the recommendation, and a neutral face if you're partially meeting it, and a frowny face if you're not at all. So okay. it's it's very intuitive, very quick. Um, 
They're very informative. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump on as soon as we're done with this podcast. I want to check and, it out for myself. <laughs> and from the, the Cancer Health Check, um, there's a free 10-week uh, challenge called the Healthy 10 Challenge, which sends emails, and, and each week there's a different challenge uh, for you to, if you want to try and improve each of the lifestyle factors. So the links are all in there. Great. Scott, this has been wonderful. I, I have some concrete changes that I can make in my medical practice and also in my personal life, which has been wonderful. I think the biggest message I've heard is maybe immunocompetence and working, do, finding out what strengthens our immune system and maintaining that. So I appreciate it. Well, Nigel, thank you again. This, is, this has been so great. Um, I hope that, uh, that we'll all come away from this having heard this. Um, with, again, actionable strategies that we can use for ourselves and for our patients. And I foresee that our patients and ourselves as physicians are going to be experiencing a lower risk in cancer after this podcast.